the masking is thoroughly dry. It's lost that milky quality and now it's completely clear. And it'll be very simple to remove. I just have to rub it off. Now that that area is thoroughly protected with the masking material, I'm going to flow in my colors. And the beauty of masking is now I can paint freely without needing to avoid going over the painted area. The red is concentrated along the central part of the petal. Take a little of my Windsor Blue, place it on my palette so I can continue to thin it out. Very good. Now I'll flow that color in towards the central part of the uh, flower. I'll take some of that magenta color and, and flow it towards the edge. What you see me doing now is lifting out just a little bit. And to move it around, I may even splatter it a bit with some water. I can't paint this petal until this dries. But what I can do is I can move around and I'll paint this area, this area. So let's just jump in. I'll dampen the petal, the half that I intend to flow my color onto. And now I will add a little bit of that magenta. Why do I dampen it? In dampening the paper, when I flow in my color on top of the dampened paper, the color doesn't suck into the paper. It floats just above the paper suspended in the water and therefore I don't get any brush marks and as it disperses I get these beautiful transitions that are not possible if you attempted to do that with brushing. So what am I doing? I'm allowing the watercolor to do what it does naturally. I'm allowing it to flow throughout a dampened surface rather than brush it on a dry surface. So I guess you can say I'm always painting into a wet surface. Okay, I like that. I'm going to leave that alone. It's subtle. That's what I needed. As I say quite often, I'm paraphrasing the visual information that I see in the flower. I'm not trying to copy it exactly. I'll let it dry. At this stage of development, it would be a nice time to begin to introduce the green of the stem and the leaf. If you notice in the original photo, there's an additional leaf. I left that out because I think it interfered with the composition of the piece. Now, for my green, I never use this green right out of the tube. I prefer my mixed greens. The green that you see here is a mixture of aureole and yellow with cobalt blue. To mix a green, I'll always start with my yellow. And then add the blue to that and gradually work my way to the color that I want. So we have predominantly yellow with some cobalt blue added. Now I'm going to add some distilled water. Add a little bit more water. Fantastic. So now you see, two beautiful natural looking greens. That's why I like to mix my own. Mixed greens are much more natural looking than two greens. We'll continue with painting our stem. First thing I want to do is dampen it. When I examine the photo carefully, I see some hints of brown undertones beneath the green of the stem. So to begin with, I'm actually going to start with the color brown. In this case, I'm using burnt sienna. But I have no intention of creating a brown stem. Into that brown, now I'm going to flow my lighter premixed green. 
what will happen is the premix green will push aside the brown, but residual traces will still be visible and it'll give the green a much richer look. In studying the photo carefully, I also see a little bit of that green in this petal, and I'd like to introduce that into my watercolor. How do I go about creating that little green line there and faded it in? Well, the first step is to dampen the section. Then using my number six brush, pick up a little of that green. And work it along the edge. It's bleeding up into the piece. I want it to move the other way and stay localized along the edge. So I'm going to add some more water. And the water will effectively push it back. Let's finish up the petals. That was the quinacridone red rose. Now it gets pretty intense, so I'm going to add a little lizard crimson into that area. And some of my phthalo blue that I immediately pull the red into. So I'm, I'm sort of mixing it on the paper to get a nice purplish. At this stage of development, I've painted in all of my petals. The uh, filaments are all masked out. And everything is completely dry. I've wiped off any remaining particles of salt because I don't want the salt particles to interfere with paint that I still need to apply. What I'd like to show you is this detail in the surface of the rubrum lily. I'll paint them in using alizarin crimson. After those are painted in, that's when I'll work around to my shadows, probably using a cobalt blue for the shadows. My initial coat will be with alizarin crimson. So I wet my paint and I apply it. The lines that you saw me draw in are simply guidelines. I don't uh, worry too much if I go out of the lines. I was never good at staying within the lines. And then in each one, before they dry, I'm going to apply some water. I'm referring to the photo, and I can see how the color areas modulate from a slightly lighter center to a darker rim. And by adding a little water into my paint that I just applied, and then wiping off excess water that happens to be on my brush, I can then go back into the form and lift out a little color. And what that results in is an area where I have a subtle transition from a lighter to a darker red. The beauty of watercolor lies in its unique ability to create interesting transitions in color. I think the effect is good and contributes to the overall look of the piece. In this petal, we have some of these little dots that work their way into the extreme dark area of the flower itself. So instead of using alizarin crimson for those, I'm going to use quinacridone magenta. For the addition of the plain water. 
I'll often continue to apply plain water as the water begins to dry, because what that does, it pushes the pigment towards the perimeter of the dot and gives me a nice darker rim around the lighter central area. If you notice the leaf is relatively light in this area and then has a shadow that's cast along here, how do I approach something like that? Well, what I do is I lay in the entire leaf as the light area. I ignore the shadow. So the color that you see here, I carry it down. Then when it's dry, I wash in my shadow on top of that using cobalt blue. The thing I have to consider is the highlight along the stem here. I can lay in the highlight now. In fact, if you look at my drawing, I drew it in. So I could actually lay in that stem first and then proceed to develop the remaining parts of the leaf. I'll dampen the area that's going to become the central vein of the leaf. Using some of my lighter green, I will wash it in to the area that I primed with water. What I like to do is add a little bit of water to that canal of paint that I have made. Because even in that small, narrow area, the application of a little bit of more water allows me to create a variation from a lighter central area to darker borders. Since I'm working with green, I can also begin to consider the center part of the flower. If we look, we see a very similar green that I just use in my stem. So I think I'll use that same green and begin to develop these areas. I dampen the area, then I apply my light green wash. And I flow in a little bit of water to push the paint around. Nice. There's also a little green area over here that's partially hidden by the filaments. I want to add it, but I want to allow that one to dry first, because in allowing that to dry, I'll get my edge line that will form a point of demarcation between that form and this form. Let's let it dry. The next area I'm going to paint is the leaf right over there. And what I'll do is first flow in the lighter green, and then when that's dry, I'll establish the shadow. I'll wet the area. Give it a light wash of burnt sienna before I apply my green. And into that, I'll flow my green. When I lay in a wash, I'll often start with a complementary color and gradually adjust the color to what I want to see. In this case, it's the green. But I started out with burnt sienna. Why do I do that? Because when I look at leaves in nature, often they have undertones of other colors. And I find this to be a very effective way to achieve that natural look. Whereas if I just applied my green, the color may look very raw. In order to do that effectively, it's often necessary to tilt your watercolor paper. So what I've done for these small pieces that I work on is I've made a cardboard support that effectively angles my paper while I tilt it to allow the excess pigment to run down and then I'll suck it up. I think I would like to apply a little bit more green. So I'll start at the top and let it flow. As it flows, it pushes out some of that brown pigment, creates wonderful variety of tone, and allows the brown pigment to move down and concentrate in that area. That's it. That's all I'm going to do right now.
at this stage of development, I'm beginning to lay in some shadows. I don't want to go crazy with the shadows, but I would like to lay in some. And I've darkened this area here, and I've worked in a little bit of shadow area over here. What I use for my shadows is primarily a wash of cobalt blue, a light wash of cobalt blue. I like what I see in this area in terms of the shadow, and I think it's necessary to articulate a shadow as it moves in towards the center of the petal because it really gives you a feeling that that's moving in towards the interior. So I will develop the shadow area and probably work in this shadow area using my cobalt blue. Now I would like to just allow that to blend lightly, so I'm going to add some plain water. It also darkens as it moves into that area. I've already done it on that side. What I'll do, since I'm going to want it to fade out of the shadow, I'm going to wet the top part. Be careful that you don't brush too much, because if you do, you could redissolve the watercolor paint and start to move color around and ruin your effect. Take a little bit of my cobalt blue and flow it in. I'm also going to paint over the green and work to plain water. Same thing here. I don't want to carry the blue over to that area again because I've already done that, so I'm just going to let it fade into plain water. I like to carry a little bit of a deeper shadow up in that area. I'm about to lay in my background, but I would like to just say a few words about my setup. I like to pre-mix my paint in these plastic containers. The reason why I like to do this is it allows me to mix enough paint to have fun with without worrying about spilling out of the tray and intermixing with other colors. I also work smaller color areas for my palette. And the surface of my palette allows me to blend and mix colors. At this stage of development, I really do need to get the background in because right now my colors are relative to the white of the paper. I need to see them against their background and then make adjustments and corrections. But I can only do that after the background is in place. Remember what I did with this area? I masked it out. The masking is still in place. After everything is dry and the background is complete, then I'll remove that masking and paint in these areas that still need to be worked. So what do I do? What is the next step? I want to paint wet into wet. Because this is 140 pound paper, and I intend to paint wet into wet, But my watercolor paper is not stapled down and stretched. What will happen is my paper will curl like this, and it'll make it impossible for me to paint what I want to paint. Well, since this is a small piece of paper, I have a technique that works well. The technique involves this. I wet the back, then I seal the paper in a plastic container for about five minutes. Wet the back, then I take a plastic container, put my watercolor in the container, like so, and cover it up. What happens is the humidity in there raises to 100%. The paper becomes thoroughly hydrated with water and flattens out, and I have a beautiful surface to paint on. 
It's been about 10 minutes. Let's see what we got. Yes, it's laying nice and flat. What I'll do at this stage is continue to dampen the surface. What have I accomplished? The piece is laying relatively flat. This is relatively dry. The painted area is relatively dry, but I've wet all the white where the background is going to go. Now in my photo, this area happens to be fairly dark down there, and I like that. I'll take some of my mixed Antwerp blue with brown matter and begin to flow in the dark area. Using the tip of my flat brush, I can get into these tight areas. Try to have fun when you're doing this. Don't stiffen up. And don't worry about copying. The main goal is to create beautiful color areas. Now I know it's rather dark and you're probably wondering where I'm going to go with this. Actually, I'm wondering the same thing. Time to work in some burnt sienna in this area. This in the actual photograph explodes with reds deep red colors and I think burnt sienna is a good way to start to work that in. Lightens up significantly on this side. Some plain water, pull it in. I'm also going to work some alizarin crimson in here. It's related to that burnt sienna. Down here, I see a hint of, of green, which I have my pre-mixed green, and I would like to respond to that by adding some green in here. Notice I'm not brushing it in. I'm allowing my paint to just flow, and that's what I want. Work in some of my cobalt blue. Beautiful color. An expensive color. My goal isn't to make a copy of the photo. My goal is to make a beautiful image that's inspired by the photograph that I've taken, but it's beautiful as an object in its own right. Quinacridone gold. Thin it down. No brushing, just let it flow. Or splatter. Understand this, aside from looking at my photo for reference, I'm also having fun with the background and I'm adjusting the colors in a way that in my mind's eye works to complement my primary subject. So the end result could be very different than what's in the photo. I approach this probably the same way I would approach an abstract painting. Where the interaction of color is my main concern. The interaction of color that will result in a beautiful finished piece. One last thing I would like to do is splatter a little bit of water into the surface to break up certain areas. Now the degree of dampness has to be correct. You don't want standing water, 
you don't want it to be too dry. You want it to have like a matte, wet look when you do this. I will take my fan brush, dip it in clean water, and I feel I need to do that in this area. At this stage, I need to finesse the piece to, to add little accents and details and, and just have fun with it. But avoid overworking it at all cost. Now to remove the dried masking fluid, how do you do that? Well, there are a number of ways. One way is you could use your finger and start to peel it off. You could also use a kneaded eraser. That works nicely. See? You know, you just have to peel it off. Or you could use a rubber cement remover to peel it off. The dried masking fluid is removed from the piece. As you could see in the photo, the um, anthers are a beautiful brown with red hints. And the filaments have much more of a green accent than mine actually do. Before I attack the anthers, what I'm going to do is add a little rich green to the filaments. I'll mix a little green, dampen it. Go to my nice mixed green, work it in. And I'll flow water into that. Now that I have the masking removed, I've begun to lay in the anthers. First, I apply a little bit of water to where I'm going to flow my color. Then, I work in burnt sienna as a base coat. And into the burnt sienna, I will add some scarlet red. So first you apply a blue wash. I'll often start with my complementary color and then adjust the color to where I want it to be. Because I love the way when you use a process like that, you get hints of the other color poking through. That makes it much more natural looking. Okay. I'm adding a little bit of scarlet red into that one now. Let's take a look at this. I think I mentioned before there's a shadow right here. I'm going to use a little bit of my cobalt blue. Whenever I want to have a shadow fade away, I'll wet the area that I want it to fade into, then apply my shadow color and pull it up against the clean water. A very light wash of the magenta over the green pushes the green into the shadow. Do you see how by starting with the blue wash, 
and then lifting color out and then flowing more brown on top of that blue wash. The blue wash gets pushed to the edge to create a nice dark border. Final thing I like to do, and this is optional, I simply like the way it looks, is I want to add a border. And I always start with a gray or a neutral tint or my mixture of brown matter and Antwerp blue. And I work from corner up and corner out. Time to go back into my gray. Little burnt sienna. It's finished. I just signed it. Just for fun, I threw a little salt up here to create a little textural contrast in the flow of color. Notice the border is essentially dark and neutral with hints of other colors. I had a tremendous amount of fun making this video and painting this painting. I hope you enjoyed watching it.